Okay, right, well, I assume that we're ready to start. Is that good? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'd like to do a quick uh, kind of straw poll at the beginning um, in terms of understanding where the audience is coming from. So who here has got a full-time job in security? Okay, it's about half. And how many are students? Okay, assume a number. And hobbyists that fall outside of two groups? Okay, so a few. Okay, okay. So we've got a fairly even split of um, in terms of people's backgrounds, um, and hopefully this talk will kind of have something for each of you. So if you think some bits are uh, too straightforward, um, then I'll, I'll get to the more complex material later on. Okay, so this presentation is about reverse engineering Android applications, and specifically reverse engineering obfuscated applications. So applications where the author or the distributor explicitly doesn't want us to understand the internal workings of the application. Um, i just quickly introduce myself. So I'm an independent software security consultant for, from London. Um, and you know, my company provides a range of software security services from like SDLC consulting and like architect and design reviews through to like white and black box assessments. Um, and as part of that, um, I do reverse engineering. So the, the presentation is going to be broken into three areas. So I'm going to go through a quick introduction to touch on the topic of you know, what is reverse engineering, what does the process look like, and a very quick primer on the Android application execution uh, runtime. And then in the second part, we'll talk about the standard um, Android reverse engineering tools and like standard techniques that people use. Um, and if you've done any Android app reverse engineering before, then that will all be fairly straightforward. Um, then in the third part, we'll go on to talk about reverse engineering obfuscated applications and you know what kinds of analysis that we can do on those applications. And obviously, I'll end with a few conclusions. So reverse engineering. In reverse engineering, rather than building something, we want to go through that process in essentially in reverse. That's its name, reverse engineering. But specifically, we want to decompose a complex uh, system um, into its constituent parts and understand how the, whole, how, how the system as a whole works and also how individual parts work. Um, and we might also want to understand how that product or how that system was constructed. Um, and in the, in the case of software, um, unlike some other things that we might want to reverse engineer, we've got a full description in how that program operates, which is the object code or like the compiled code. And we want to go from that compiled code to understandable, you know, an understandable description of the program. And this, there are two you know, groups of techniques that we can use. Static analysis, where we're looking at the application on disk without running it, and runtime analysis, where we're running it maybe in an augmented or modified execution environment. But since we're talking about obfuscated applications, I'm going to focus on the, the former. We're going to focus on static analysis. So in reverse engineering, the whole um, variety of things that we can you know, take as input into the process the first and the most obvious for our purposes is compiled object code. Um, and if we're doing dynamic analysis, then program behavior uh, would be kind of the main input. But there are lots of other things that we can use to kind of give us clues, to help us like form hypotheses about how the system works. That includes things like configuration files, any static resources. Um, if we're reverse engineering a, a client, which is a normal case for an Android application, then the server will also give us ideas as to how the client operates. Um, and there's public documentation stands that we can let. Um, we can look at similar systems. So if we're looking at, say, an end-to-end -end encryption client, we might look at, say, open source implementations, look at the design patterns that they use, and try and spot the same use of those patterns in the system that we're actually trying to reverse engineer. And of course, there's things like open source code and patents um, that we, we can use to, uh, to again, give us, give us more clues. Um, probably a less obvious um, kind of clue, 
less obvious clues that we can use are things like company structures and history. If we look at a large company and the history of acquisitions and mergers, that can actually give us clues as to how the software um, has been constructed and how it's evolved o over time. And also things like uh, you know, leaked documents and uh, developer LinkedIn pages. So static versus dynamic analysis, we typically want to combine both of these approaches. Um, static analysis is especially useful if there's you know, any mechanism which is trying to prevent dynamic analysis. So we might start with static analysis, modify the application so that we can, can then um, kind of analyze it uh, oh no, at, at runtime. And likewise, dynamic analysis might be better if the, if the application is heavily obfuscated. Um, okay, so, so when we're applying this approach, we're typically looking at an app which has been heavily obfuscated, but we, where we need to know the specific implementation details of, of a protocol or of something, um, and, and we can't get the knowledge that we need through purely dynamic analysis. I'm just going to give a qu very quick uh, briefer on um, the legal aspects of reverse engineering. It's worth touching these. With a normal disclaimer that I am not a lawyer, um, but ultimately reverse engineering is not illegal, but there are a whole variety of things that could curtail your ability to, to conduct reverse engineering. Um, probably the most common ones, especially for hobbyists, might be like end user license agreements. Um, but there is a, there are a whole raft of you know laws which are uh, relevant. Um, typically, or I don't know, I don't want to say too much because you know this isn't an area that I specialise in. Um, uh, but you know, think, things like copyright protect the expression. Of, of a computer program, so typically things like source code, and if you've got compiled ob object code, then that's typically not um, you know, covered by, by copyright. And obviously this is also a, a changing field, so even though people are worrying about the Wassenaar arrangement in terms of like um, you know, distribution of exploits and exploitation techniques, there's a lot of overlap for reverse engineering. So as each country implements the law differently, you could see that um, reverse engineering is, is effective like that. But there's a, there's a long, well-established history of reverse engineering. People reverse engineering physical products and trying to make competitors. And you know, kind of the right to reverse engineer something is seen as spurring um, innovation. OK, so I'm going to talk about the two. Oh, sorry. I'm going to talk about um, Android runtimes. Now, Obviously, when you think of Android applications, you think of the open source um, uh, Android project. But there are a whole, there are a number of variations on this. So, obviously, Google Play has got uh, a slightly lot more locked down and controlled ecosystem, um, and you have to agree to certain things in order to use the, you know, to have to have applications on your platform, be able to access um, Google Play services. But then other applications with fewer native applications of their own have implemented uh, you know, Android players you know, based on the open source code so that they can run, they can take advantage of the huge number of applications in the Google Play Store and, and run them on their own uh, applications. So that includes um, operating systems like BlackBerry 10, uh, Sailfish, and I heard some recent talk about Windows 10 supporting Android apps on the desktop. I don't know any de more details about that. So the first Android runtime, uh, which ships with the first Android, is called Dalvik. It's named after a small fishing town in, in Iceland. And it's essentially very, very similar to, to, to now Oracle's um, Java virtual machine. So, it's, so it uses an application virtual machine that will take um, like opcodes for a, a virtual CPU and it will compile them at runtime on the fly into, um, into code for the actual native processor, whether that be ARM or x86 or MIPS. So what, what the Delphi runtime does is it optimizes this virtual machine, or, or rather changes the configuration of the, um, kind of the virtualized CPU and makes it into something that's more appropriate for mobile devices. Because Android is only, you know, only targeting uh, mobile devices at, at this point, and so 
when you install an Android application, part of the application package will be a DEX file or a downloadable executable. And when you install the application, that can be optimized for your specific device, for your particular version of the operating system. And this allows you to uh, maintain compatibility across a whole wide range of devices, but still be able to do per device optimization. More recently, though, um, they've started shipping Art. So Art shipped in uh, originally with KitKat, um, but it's now the default runtime in Lollipop. Instead of taking the JIT approach, when you install the application, it actually gets compiled um, into native code. Um, so it's a very different, a very different, uh, very different architecture. But common to both approaches, you've got essentially Java source code and you know native modules that are compiled into a, an application package, and the compiled Java code um, is taken from the you know, is converted into a dex into the dex file. And the different runtimes will interpret that DEX differently. So Dalvik will optimize it, but it will still be essentially the same thing. Um, Art, on the other hand, will convert it into a native executable, uh, typically in the, the ELF format. OK, so I'm now going to kind of lead through the basic process that you would follow in order to kind of take apart an Android application and see how it works. So first of all, we need an APK. We need, we need that static um, code to, to decompile. You can do this using so there are online um, you know, web applications that will download that, that APK from Google Play for you. There are also some browser plugins. Or alternative, this might be better. Um, you, can actually, you can just copy the APK off of the device. Um, and the advantage of, of that is that you can, you can be sure that the the, stat the static analysis that you're doing is the same as the app that you're looking at on the device. Or alternatively, you could download the APK from a dodgy Chinese app store, um, but that's maybe not um, uh, advisable for, for the obvious reasons. So, so an APK file, so the distribution unit for Android apps, is essentially a zip file. And inside that zip file, there are a number of folders. Um, so the assets are... Um, specific files which are referenced by the by like by the developer, like explicitly, I want to open hello.txt. Um, you've got libraries which can lib which contains any like native uh, code. So na yeah, native code is loaded by the application that can maybe you do implement functionality that isn't appropriate for excuse me uh, for Java. Uh, the meta inf folder is essentially a folder containing um, the digital signatures for the application. So this is what you need to verify that um, you know the app hasn't been tampered with, that it was signed by the expected um, author, and so on. And then there's a resource file, which is again assets, but that aren't explicitly being referenced by the application. They're they're generated as part of the uh, like the Android like UI. Um, generation so part of so the the SDK kind of arranges these um, kind of creates these files on your behalf it's to explain how the screen is laid out and to you know embed icons um, and then there's through there are normally three files th you know three other files the Android manifest is essentially the contract between the application and the operating system that says you know how you expect the app to be used and how it should um, interact with the operating system. Uh, Classes.dex, that's our object code. So that's what we need to compile if we want to get back to um, you know, understanding the, uh, you know, the individual operations that the application is doing. And then resources.arc file, that's um, kind of a single conglomerate of smaller resources like strings that you don't want to put in their uh, individual individual files. And so when, we go, when we're reverse engineering the file to get back, ultimately we want to get back to an understandable code or some other understandable representation of the program. So we start with an APK, we extract the DEX byte code, we can then disassemble that code into something called Smiley disassembly. Uh, you can see that on the right. Uh, and then from Smiley, we can use a decompiler to produce Java source code. You can see that on the left. 
Oh, they're, they're, sorry, they're completely different um, code. Um, and then, and then we need like human um, analysis to get from that to understandable code. So one one tool that you may have heard of, which is extremely useful and extremely easy to use, is called APK tool. And what that allows you to do is go between your APK and Smiley disassembly. And so it, it kind of packages a few different operations together. And because of that, it hides some of you know what's happening under you know un, kind of under the covers. Um, which means that if you're trying to reverse engineer a more complicated app that maybe um, I don't know doesn't want APK tool to be able to unpack it, then you know this process might not work. So it's better to to break the process down into into smaller um, substages. So with one operation, uh, we can use APK tool to decode and then pull out the Dex byte code, and then separately. Um, use back Smiley, which is like a Smiley disassembler, to go from the computer readable uh, bytecode into the human readable but not yet human understandable uh, Smiley disassembly. And we can also go back the other way. So instead of back Smiley, we use Smiley, and then instead of uh, and instead of APK tool decode, we can use APK build. Um, however, because because the Dalvik virtual machine is so closely related to the Java virtual machine, um, what someone realized is that if you can tra translate your DEX code into essentially you know, code for the JVM, a Java archive, then we can use existing Java reverse engineering tools to, to decompile the code. And so by using DEX to JAR, and JD GUI, which is a, a popular free Java decompiler, we can actually um, produce uh, Java source code. Um, up until now, these have all been free tools. There's actually a, a commercial tool which kind of integrates this whole process um, uh, called the JEB decompiler, but that's actually quite an expensive commercial tool, and they recently changed the licensing. So if you hadn't bought it as of a few weeks ago, then it's going to be a lot more expensive um, going forward. Um, I'm not going to cover this too much in this presentation, but quick detour. Um, if you want to modify the APK, then the best, the best way of doing that is to modify the Smiley uh, disassembly. And then you can use the Android SDK tools to um, re-sign uh, the application. Um, and if your phone is in development mode, then you can essentially use like a, a developer signing key, which again ships with the, the APK, and then that the modified code will then successfully run on a on a device. Um, yeah, and that can be installed using ADB. So at this point, hopefully we've got a complete Java listing of the code with like essentially the same code that the developer wrote. Um, and you know this is a serious risk for software development companies because if you've spent you know months of developer time or years of developer time you know writing your code, you don't someone just to be able to take your end deliverable and then to convert it back into source code and then maybe steal your ideas or steal your implementation. So this is where Java obfuscators um, uh, come in useful. So we want to obfuscate. Well, not us. We want to do the reverse. But some people want to reverse. I'm getting confused. Um, some people want to hide the implementation of their applications, and so they use obfuscators. This is a logo of a Finnish um, death metal band uh, called Obfuscation. I don't know if anyone can read that at the back. And so we can look at um, obfuscated um, applications, much like you know metal band logos. If you can read the Java code, then your obfuscator is not good enough. Okay. Um, are there any questions at this point? I'll stop briefly for questions. No. Okay. Good. Right. So now we're going to get into the meat of things. How do we go about analysing applications which have been 
obfuscated. What techniques are used and what techniques can we use to, to, to overcome that? So uh, this came from an application that I was looking at um, and I put it into JD GUI and I essentially get a morass of totally un or seemingly totally unreadable code. Every, every, every class, every variable, every field has been renamed to a single character Unicode name. So we've got classes that you know, use like Hindi characters and all sorts of you know, semantically meaningless names. So if we want to do static analysis of this, we need to, I don't know, we need to come up with some techniques to be able to translate large amounts of obfuscated code. However, it's not, it's not all bad. There are certain things that just can't be obfuscated. So if you've got a primitive uh, type that's used by the Dalvik VM, say like an int or, um, or a string, or you've got an API function which has been provided by the OS, those things can't easily be obfuscated. Because if you try and rename a function that you're calling um, as part of the Android SDK, then your, your application is no longer compatible with, you know, with that version of Android. Likewise, any APIs which are exporting, they can't be obfuscated, otherwise you'll break integrations with other people's code. Um, and any code that relies on Java reflection, so code that makes decisions based on the structure of other Java code. So even though the code has been obfuscated, we can still kind of make some vague sense of some parts of the application. So we can see that I know it's doing some encryption and then it's forming a string based on the encrypted uh, values. But for example, we don't have any variable names. And so we have to go from the API calls and kind of work backwards and figure out you know, what does this variable actually do? What, you know, how does it change the, the system? So one, one, th one thing that really doesn't change uh, when you obfuscate an application is the structure of classes. In Java, um, each, each class can only inherit from a single parent class, um, unlike things like C++, which support multiple inheritance. Um, and as a result, we can kind of, we can kind of traverse the um, inheritance graph and make reason like deductions about specific classes. So from this, we know that class A is an object, it's not derived from um, a more complex class, um, and then we've got two subclasses of that. And so that tells us a little bit, but not very much about um, what those classes actually do. However, if, if, class, if instead of class A, or instead of having like an obfuscated name, it's actually, an a, it's actually a class which is part of the Android SDK, say like service, then we can reason that class B and class C are both types of Android service. And we can apply this same approach. Um, instead of looking at inheritance, we look, can look at the information of interfaces. So in this case, class A implements the iSerializable interface. So we can reason that classes A, B, and C are all serializable objects. Maybe they do some kind of um, you know, application data storage. Um, it, it can start getting very hairy if you've got you know, lots of interfaces, you know, lots of um, subclasses. So we may want to prioritize which interfaces and which um, parent classes we're most interested in as reverse engineers. So we can say uh, C is you know, um, some object um, and class B is some other, you know, so, some other type of object, but where maybe we care more about you know, the, the interface in red than the, the more generic uh, interface at the top. So typically, the more, the more specific a class, the more specific an interface is, the more it tells us about the function or the specialization of an object. Um, the other thing is you can't really obfuscate an Android manifest. Because it's a contract between the application and the, and the rest of the system, it, it, it has to be readable by the system. It has to be in a well-defined format. 
And that well defined format is the uh, Android XML format. It's like a binary XML format. So you can just use the SDK tools to, to unpick this. And in, inside there, that, that essentially defines a lot of the attack surface of the application. So it will tell you which system events the application is you know, listing out for in terms of registered broadcast receivers. It can tell you about um, activities. And if these are public, then these are essentially attack surface exposed to other applications on the device. It tells us about content stores um, at, in terms of which Android, which Android calls content providers. And whether or not these are you know, publicly exposed or not, um, if they're defined in the manifest, then you know, that information is, is kind of disclosed through the reverse engineer. And likewise, we can know all about the permissions uh, that are defined. There's no way to, to obfuscate that kind of information. Uh, and lastly, services, which are essentially portions of code which can run in the background. Um, so even when the application's main UI isn't running, code can still run on the device. So if you've got, say, like a VoIP client, the service will listen out for uh, incoming calls. Yeah, so if we're trying to manually go through and understand um, the code, we want to focus on the areas that, which are most of interest to us. Um, so if you're trying to do a security assessment, then any classes uh, which are related to external inputs you know, become kind of candidate points for us to start to do some reverse engineering. But especially when an application is heavily obfuscated, um, we want to look for other things. So, you know, kind of any references to cryptography um, or any kind of like large arrays of random looking data, or for reason to come obvious later, um, any kind of use of the reflection API, such as get this method or invoke this method. Um, and so, yeah, there are some common obfuscations that are used. Obviously, each obfuscator is going to do things slightly differently. It's going to implement, it's going to have different features, and it's going to implement those features in different ways. Um, but these are some common techniques. Um, and really, they, they split into two groups. So those that either improve, improve performance or you know, basically don't degrade performance, and those that degrade performance. So the ones that maintain the same level of performance are likely to enable by default. And then whether or not you use the more invasive obfuscations depend on um, how important application performance is. So an obfuscate can do things like remove dead code, which is a very simple optimization. As we saw earlier, um, you can use it to rename classes, so uh, you know, with methods and fields and variables, so they no longer have semantically useful names. Logging code, which can normally be quite illuminating, is also removed. And then it's able to do any kind of like peephole optimization, optimizations in the same way that ODEX, you know, kind of the optimized DEX process does. So if you're multiplying and dividing by a power of two, then you can turn that into a shift or you know, those kind of things that make the code semantically more difficult to understand. Uh, but yeah, more interesting are the obfuscations that degrade performance, so things like string encryption. Reverse engineering one on one is like run strings on the uh, on the on the application, and with string encryption, we actually remove any human readable strings from the from the application. We can also also do call hiding with reflection, and I'll talk about those two methods in more detail in a bit. Um, the, those assets which are loaded from uh, you know the asset folder in the APK. We can choose to encrypt those so that if you just open up the AK, you can't actually read the contents. Um, we can do control flow um, obfuscation. So change the order and the kind of arrangement of how instructions are executed whilst maintaining kind of an equivalent, um, an equivalent program. We can also throw in junk, junk code. Um, that maybe has completely surf superfluous uh, references to, to encryption or, or, or to other things that might mislead a reverse engineer. And we can also do data flow operations. So instead of maybe moving a value from one um, value, sorry, from one register to another, we can use multiple XOR operations to, 
to swap the two registers. But just do anything that makes it harder to reason about um, what, what the code is really doing or why it's doing it. Okay, so the first example I'm going to talk about DexGuard string encryption. Um, and I'll quickly introduce ProGuard and DexGuard. So ProGuard ships for free uh, with Android SDK, and it's kind of the bog standard um, APK optimizing um, uh, tool. And so it's the one that's recommended uh, by Google. And yeah, and this is free. DexGuard, however, by the same author, but it has. It has, you know, it has some of those more advanced ob obfuscation features. So I'm looking at this application, and I start to see code like this. So I can see that it's opening up one of those assets, um, but I can't see the name. I can't see the file name of the asset, which would be normal for the, this type of code. Instead, it's doing, you know, some references and some kind of lookup table, and it's kind of taking three of these arguments, and then presumably that returns a string. So this. Op this lookup function is turning those three values into a string. So if we want to understand the string encryption, we need to dive into the specifics of you know, this particular function and, un and you know, reverse engineer to understand what it's doing, what it's doing and why it's doing it. Um, so the, on the next few slides, there's going to be lots of code, but the, the code itself isn't particularly important. Um, but what is important is kind of the logic that you go through to reason about what the code does and how you can do that step by step and take what appears to be um, you know, a hard, you know, reasonably hard to understand code and make turn into something useful. Um, but we could avoid all of this by just copying the code, not understanding it, and then you know, inputting the, the arguments from the code and that will just hand us back the decrypted strings. So this is more of a useful exercise if you want to like, kind of automate the process, so you're not copying and pasting uh, code. So uh, we have a lookup function, and it takes um, three, arts, three integer arguments, and it returns us a string. OK, so the first thing that we can reason about is it's returning a string. So you know, that's the value that we actually care about. Where does that string come from? Well, it comes from the out buffer, which is like a but yeah, just an array of bytes. Okay, so we can rename that byte array to out buffer. So it's, it's clear as to what the purpose of that is. And we can see that we're, we're copying values into this buffer in, in some kind of a loop. So it's in this loop, we're referencing an, an integer um, and that integer gets incremental in every iteration, and it's compared to some other number before it exits the loop and returns to our string. Okay, so we can say that integer is i, it's our, it's our loop counter, rename it to i. Again, we kind of add, with each step, we're adding semantic information about what the code actually does. It's not an integer, it's a, it's a loop counter. Likewise, we compare this loop counter to some other value before we return the string. So we can say, well, um, well, we can also see that that's used in the byte in allocating the byte array. So we say, well, this is this is a length. So we can rename 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 that to a length. Then we can see that we've got this second. Oh, sorry, sorry. The, the first argument is being cast to a byte and put into this, this byte array, which we know is later turned into a string. So well, this byte value, that must actually be a character. Uh, we can see that's an argument, so that gives us another one of our arguments. And then we have another index which is being incremented on every iteration of the loop, um, but it doesn't, it doesn't bear any relation to the length of the, the byte array. Um, and if you see that the bottom one, it's actually being used uh, as an index into our lookup table, so which is a table of seemingly random data. Okay, so because it's random, we're going to call that our key just for the sake of argument. Um, you know, that might later turn out to be wrong. Okay, so we're slowly building up um, what it is. So we've 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 renamed our three uh, variables. 
our, sorry, our three arguments, and we're in a position to say what this function actually does. So on each iteration of the, of the loop, this character value is being updated. And it's being updated by subtracting some constant value, in this case 29, and then you're adding, um, uh, yeah, you're adding some, some values to give you a new character. So this is really kind of like a, a differential uh, key value. So in, in summary, we go, we have an array of bytes, and what it really describes is the differences between consecutive um, uh, characters in a string. Our first argument says, you know, what our starting character is, not necessarily the first character in the string. A second one is where we start, you know, looking at our key. So we're kind of taking a sub key from this, this array. And the third one is, is the length. So if you have a start value of, say, b, a start index of 1, a length of 3, we can kind of go through and say, well, b plus, you know, that difference is c. We've got c, we add the next difference, minus 2. We get a, and a plus the next difference gives us a t. So we've turned these three integers in a random array into a string, cat. Um, so an interesting puzzle would be, well, if you can see these big uh, blocks of, uh, of random bytes, can we like search, can we kind of, kind of like brute force the key and work out what those strings are? Um, and actually, I think you probably can't do that without decompiling the code because there are certain constants that change, um, I think, with, with each successive uh, compilation of, of the code. So you need to be able to extract those other constants, um, but you know, may, maybe, maybe it's doable. Um, the next technique I wanted to talk about was call hiding. Um, so if you make a call to an API, say an encryption API, then that allows a reverse engineer to focus in on that bit of code, say, well, I want to look at how the app does encryption. Um, but if you do that, then you can statically determine very easily that you know, those encryption APIs are being used. So a way around this is to uh, encrypt the name of the function, encrypt the name of the function you want to call, and then use the reflect, and then use, yeah, decrypt that, and then use the reflection APIs to do the actual API call. So statically, um, you know, you, d you don't know that the function is being called. Okay, so everything I've been talking about until now has all been based around uh, Java uh, and, and Dalvik bytecode, but I just want a quick, um, quick thing about native code, because you can have both inside an Android application. So inside your, your lib directory, um, there are further subdirectories which refer to the different uh, hardware platforms, so like ARM, MIPS, x86, or like the different uh, variants of, of ARM. And then you would use the, the Java JNI or the Java native interface to essentially marshal calls between the two between the two between the two languages. And so this will typically start with um, a system.load load library call, call foo, and then it will load the library from the uh, from the lib directory. Um, if you ever use IDA Pro, um, it's got pretty good support for understanding this stuff. It can understand when when a call is being, you know, exposed via JNI, and the JNI call has a couple of like standard arguments that helps um, kind of helps in the marshalling between the two languages. So the first argument is the JNI env, and this is essentially an object that allows you to do things like make calls in the Java VM, you know, allocate Java objects, deallocate Java objects, um, and it just kind of, yeah, it kind of does all the all the heavy listening, all kind of all the the call translation for you. The second argument is is essentially a pointer to a J object. So it's if you call a method on a class then this will give you a pointer to the instance of that class inside the JVM, which otherwise you wouldn't have access to from native code unless you want to do uh, crazy parsing of, of runtime state. Um, and then following that are any, are any arguments. 
Um, okay, so I'll just leave you with some conclusions. Um, obfuscate, obfuscators are really good at slowing down attackers. There, is a, there are certain trade-offs that you, that you make in terms of kind of application speed and the number of obfuscations that you want. Um, but you, you have a situation similar to AV where there's kind of a, a, an arms race happening between people that want to stop their code and being read and people that want to re read their code. Um, and this applies not only to legitimate applications from the App Store, um, but also or, or also malware. So the, these these uh, tactics, are, sorry, these techniques are, are quite applicable. Um, probably the most important thing, probably to point out to like non you know non security people, is that obfuscators don't don't on the whole don't fix vulnerabilities. They just make them harder to find using static analysis techniques. Um, so if, you, if you're doing a, an assessment of, a, of an Android application, I would highly recommend that you, you try and do the assessment with source code if your end goal is to try and secure um, that application as best you can. Obviously, in this presentation, I've just tried to kind of give you some jumping off points. So if you're interested in this topic, you can uh, go and learn some more. There's only so much that you can cover in a, an hour's presentation. So here's some books I recommend. Uh, so the mobile app, Hacker's Handbook, is like a good introductory resource. Um, Android Security Internals um, you know, is a great book if you want to go a lot deeper. It, you know, it describes how um, kind of the platform security mechanisms work, which is yeah, and there's like some very, very uh, in-depth uh, discussion about those. You know, things like hardware, um, hardware-backed key storage, uh, and then finally a book which has got nothing to do with Android whatsoever, and um, a practical reverse engineering by uh, Bruce Dang and Co. Um, this is just a great resource in general if you're interested in reverse engineering. The focus is definitely on native code reverse engineering, but a lot of the principles and the ideas are. You know, applicable everywhere. Uh, when I publish the slides, I will obviously have links to all the tools and stuff that I mentioned. The, there are a couple of tools which I, I didn't cover in this presentation, um, both free tools. So Radare is like a general reverse engineering uh, framework uh, that has some Android functionality. There's also AndroGuard, uh, which is also free and and I think that you know they've been working on a decom a decompiler. Um, yeah, very good tool. So, yeah, if anyone has any questions, let's hear them. Yeah. No, so basically, if you go, if there is some authority and, and now an application can be able to do that the best based on that you see the code, which is. Be malware. Well, so I mean, if you want to reverse engineer application, like you don't know ahead of time whether it's malware or a legitimate application, but you know, reverse engineering is useful in in kind of both both situations. Any other questions? No. Nope? Okay. Great. Well, if you want to talk about this more, you can grab me in the bar later on. But thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>